Alright, this video is going to serve as a bit of an addendum to my previous video on the three basic fault types. And we're going to focus in specifically on the stresses. That's going to be the focus of this video. And if you're a little bit unfamiliar with stress, the concept of stress, I'd urge you to look into it on your own. I'll give you a brief overview and hopefully that'll give you enough to have a functional understanding for this video. But just know that I've got a playlist on rock mechanics that goes a little bit into some of the more mathematical detail of stress. Um, it's a very simple concept that is explored on probably millions of videos through different engineering, physics, mathematics, geology channels like this one. Um, so I would urge you to do a little bit of your own research if you're a little bit less familiar with the concept. But hopefully you understand it well enough to just get through this pretty, pretty basic uh, explanation I'm going to go through here. I'll also say, uh, sorry if the wind starts picking up a little bit. It is absolutely ripping out there. We had a nice little spring storm. Spring has definitely sprung. April hits and all of a sudden it's like, ooh, giant just wind and rain and everything. But that's, uh, that's neither here nor there. So I'm writing out here the three basic fault types that I discussed in the previous video, right? Reverse, normal, strike, slip. And of course, normal and reverse can be broadly described as dip slip as the opposite of strike slip. And remember, that's based on where the slip occurs in the direction of the strike or in the direction of the dip. Right, so with all of these, you know, we'll give our brief little review here. Again, if you need more of this, check out my previous video. The normal fault, this foot wall, this lower block is gonna move up relative to that upper block which comes down. Reverse is gonna be the reverse of the normal fault where this hanging wall on the upper side of this angle moves up and the foot wall moves down and then strike slip if you change your view instead of looking in your cross-sectional view all of a sudden you're looking in plan or or top down all of a sudden you see it's moving along the strike of that plane so you'll have one of these blocks moving uh, north and south or east and west or whatever directions those are right and it could be a right-handed or a left-handed strike slip fault but that's not particularly important because we're focusing on the stress types and what you'll see is that each of these basic fault types is associated with a basic stress type. So again, here's the basic introduction to stress, right? Stress is derivative from the physical concept of force. And hopefully forces we all have a good intuition for, right? Newton's second law, F equals MA. You can apply a force to something by pushing on it, by pulling on it. Your weight is a force, all of these things, right? And a stress is just, really, it's a, it's a force F per unit area A, right? So a force per unit area basically takes something that's very external, a force, and make it something more internal, something that is on a, at the area of the surface, the surface area of an object like, like a fault plane. So if we draw a little area out here, then you can think of the stress is coming in. You know, maybe it starts off as a force, but... If this is a tiny little area and we're still static, that is not moving, remember that means zero acceleration means the forces have to balance, then we're going to have a, something on the other side, an opposite reaction, and that's what describes our stress, right? A force is necessarily one direction. A stress is two directions that are always opposite each other, and they give us three different terms from that, right? We can have different from stresses either pointing towards each other, away from each other, or moving past each other. We can have three different stress types. And so the first of those is going to be compression. And that's the one that I drew on that little square right there, compression. Of course, if you think about, you know, compressing something with your hands, you know, if you think about putting something in a hydraulic press, these are all compressive actions. So that's two things coming together, right? Forcing something together, confining it. The opposite of compression is going to be tension, which, you know, again, this should be pretty easy to visualize. You take a piece of string, some rope, some fishing line, something like that. You pull it taut and you say it's in tension, right? And if you put too much tension on it, maybe it snaps. So that's, of course, the arrows would be moving away from each other. Again, the stress or you might be able to think of them as force arrows, even if you're more comfortable with the concept of force. 
And then finally, the third category is going to be shear, which basically means that there's some offset between the forces. They're not they're not running through the same axis would be the big thing. And they could be moving, they will be moving in opposite directions, right? Something like this. So you might look at the directions of the arrows and think similar to compression, but the key difference here is that there's an offset between the axis, right? They're not moving through the same kind of imaginary line here. So of course, each of these different stress types is going to be associated with different geologic environments. If, if you think about compression, right, think of at the broadest scale, right, two plates coming together, you know, a convergent environment, compression, convergence, tension, think about a rifting center, a, a seafloor spreading, rock being spread apart, forced apart by rising mantle plume beneath it, right, that's going to be diver a divergent plate boundary. And then shear, think about giant plates just kind of slowly grinding and sliding past each other, as is the case in transform boundaries, right? And then at the more micro scale, you might think with compression, maybe you have a magma body that's exerting a force outwards on all of the rocks surrounding it, right? Compressing it into itself, something like that. You can go into the details of all the different types of sites you might see, the geologic uh, intricacies of different places in the world. But we'll keep it at that for now and move on to a discussion of what types of stress we see with each of these fault types. And again, I go into a lot of discussion kind of theoretically on this in my rock mechanics playlist. This I want to keep a little bit separate from that. But I will say this, understanding the types of stress present in your rock mass is incredibly important for any time you're doing tunneling, excavations, mining through it, right? You're going to have to understand how stressed that rock is so you can understand how competent it is, which is, of course, important for the stability of an excavation, the safety of the workers, you know, the economic viability. Can we even get down there to begin with? Uh, what type of equipment do we need? All of these big, important, you know, engineering and project management and, and just basic feasibility questions are downstream of what is the rock like, right? So that's kind of the motivation behind this. Stress is a very important thing to understand. And so when we get into each of the basic fault types, right, the way I like to think about it, we'll start with normal here, right? And I'll give you the basic kind of uh, formula I use. Draw a fault plane, right? Some plane, again, we'll say we're looking at this. We'll, we'll draw the blocks, too. We're looking at this in cross-section. It's a very basic view, right? Perfectly planar little fault plane there. And then I like to think of in what direction are the blocks moving relative to each other, right? So we know that this is moving up, right? The foot wall is moving up and the hanging wall is moving down. The foot wall moves up, then it's normal. That's the little fun, uh, little mnemonic device I talked about in that previous video. And then what I like to do is say completely ignore the vertical component of this line right now. Not to get, I said I wouldn't get too mathematical, but if you have some background with vectors, then of course you might think of these two as little vectors, right? little directional arrows, right? And then isolate the horizontal component, right? So you know that a vector is comprised of a horizontal component and a vertical component, right? Say, let's just say ignore the vertical component, right? And then look at how those two arrows inter are interacting with each other. And in the case of the normal fault, we have then this block is moving away and this block is moving away to the right, right? So that means that normal faults are the result of tension. They don't cause tension. Remember, faults are the result of stresses. They are the result of tension is a normal fault. Reverse faults then, at this point you should be pretty quick to catch on. A reverse fault is going to be the opposite of a normal fault, so it's going to contain the opposite of tension. If we have the hanging wall moving up like this and the foot wall moving down, again, isolate those horizontal components. This block is moving to the right. 
This one's moving into the left. Oh, they're coming together. So the reverse fault is the result of compression. And that was kind of a quick way to remember the difference between the two and what causes them, right? Understanding, I also like to kind of do it with my hands. Imagine pushing your hands together at an angle like that and thinking about which way they would slip. Just a quick kind of visualization that intuitively makes sense, geometrically makes sense. And finally, the strike slip. You draw your little blocks here. This one's maybe a little bit less uh, intuitive. <laughs> or honestly, it kind of just, you know, you have one going down and one coming up, right? To me, that's just kind of obvious. Okay, they're off they're not on the same axis at this point right there's not really a horizontal component in this drawing at that point you just remember these are different strike slips are shear i think in the picture just if you know what shear stresses look like that that basic drawing excuse me is very much reminiscent of a shear stress so again the main importance behind this is understanding the what kind of stress states your in situ rock could be in. Of course, you can do testing on rock and see what kind of strength and what kind of stress it might be under uh, in the environment, but a lot of times that takes people and that takes money. So just being able to kind of get an idea, a kind of thousand-yard view of overall what is the rock mass doing, understanding the faults that are present is incredibly important. And understanding the difference between a normal and a reverse and what they indicate in terms of the stress uh, that's happening with the rock is going to be a great asset to you uh, when you're talking about designing a, a tunnel or a mine or something or, or any time when you're, when you're dealing with moving rock. You know, you want to install anything subterranean, you know, maybe it's a, maybe you're doing, oh boy, <laughs> Maybe a, a ground source heat pump, right? A little geothermal energy, right? I don't know any of this, you know? Get creative with it. Or, you know, maybe you're just interested in understanding what the rock around you is doing, what, the, what, the, uh, what nature has in store for you, getting a greater appreciation for the world around you. Maybe that's a bit of a stretch, though. Maybe people don't really want to learn about that. Maybe they just want to, you know, kind of understand stuff take a test, get out of school, and then never think about it again. I don't know. But that's going to about do it for now. Hopefully that was informative or good review, one of the two. And I think that'll cover it on these, these fault basics for now. We'll get back to some rock mechanics or some other fun little topic later. So thanks for watching. Have a good one.